Hey everyone, my name is Michael Clemens. Thank you for having me. Today, I will present our work on a CBR approach to plug-in parameter selection in vocal audio production. Now as much fun as it would be to type out my entire presentation and let AWS Poly take it over, I think I'll continue from here on out. So what you just heard is the difference in prosody between my voice and it's called Matt from AWS Poly. So prosody is referred to basically the packaging of the sentence rather than the lexical content itself. So it's everything that really conveys the emotion, uh, conveys the attitude of my speech, or for sarcasm, for example, can alter the meaning of the speech entirely. And once again, it is the packaging rather than the lexical channel that I use for myself. So segueing away from the linguistic research, because I don't want to dip too much into that, we're going to be continuing in the audio domain from here on out. Audio production is known as the manipulation and design of audio for consumer needs. So it's a general term encompassing all of audio manipulation, sound recording, live sound, sound editing, digital audio production work, anything like that. So from initial music ideation to the completed sound artifact at the end of the day, music producers use complex audio tools in order to actually complete and fulfill their artistic criteria for whatever they're trying to produce at the end of the day. So it's very difficult, or and all of this really matters, just because you end up a logical well, option such as this. Essential aspect of communication within media. Should the production quality be low, communicating the narrative may be an exercise in futility, since the voice may be incomprehensible. So you probably heard this on Zoom, where somebody has really crappy quality audio, and you can't really understand. And even though their video may be pristine, they may have like an HD camera. Uh, the meaning of what they're saying isn't conveyed, so the entire message is basically compromised. If you would rather have one audio or one channel for communication, it should be audio rather than video. So to this end, audio engineers normally use a digital audio workstation to complete audio production, and a digital audio workstation is either an electronic device or really a piece of software that affords the user the opportunity to fulfill their music production needs. And some examples of here include Ableton Live, GarageBand is probably the one most of you are familiar with if you use Mac, Logic Pro, FL Studio, Cubase, and Reaper. All of these are pretty well known in the industry. Audio plugins are self-contained pieces of code that are really plugged into the digital audio workstation that enhance their functionality to some degree. And typical plugins normally fall into three categories, the three being instrument plugins, we have effect plugins and then analyzer plugins. So to process the streaming audio, the digital audio workstation calls in a frame of audio data and then receives back the frame of processed audio data as the input to the DAW. So whenever a plugin parameter changes, so in skeuomorphic terms, whether a slider in the plugin actually changes, it's modified and reflected back in the DAW GUI. AI music has become such a large market in the industry and startups are really popping all over that you probably have heard of um, and they always say that they have the solution to music composition and production loads uh, something like that there's been a lot of large claims for this i'm just going to provide some examples from all different facets of ai music because it can get really nitpicky if you try to follow one uh, particular niche so google magenta is the research team that has really sparred a lot of this research and continues to publish widely on this topic uh, Mu Me, which is Music Meta Creation within the IEEC Workshop or IEEC Conference, uh, they published here widely. And then we have Dolby I.O. that really focuses on mixing and mastering in audio production. We have Amper, who works on soundtrack music genre generation. Solaris, if you never heard of this, it's a complete AI voice. So you type in the lyrics you wanted to say. Um, it's more like a linguistic research, but you can have essentially an AI sing your entire song for you. Then you have OpenAI, which has MuseNet, um, and they do complete like I think two to three minute segments that are completely generated for a particular audio genre. And then we have Atlas, which is a plug-in to digital workstation that uses similar ML technologies to Magenta, so it's just a beat composition tool. And these are just some examples, but there are much more. So within intelligent audio plugin literature, two main tasks have really been targeted. One is plugin recommendation, which deals with what plugin you should use. 
and within a particular audio chain, the sequence of those. Should you do them in parallel? Should you do them in series? And what order series? And then the other one is parameter tuning, and that's what I focused on. However, CVR has never focused on these two within the literature. They focused on other aspects of music, which include music generation and then music recommendation. So even though it hasn't necessarily been studied in the literature before, I believe that CVR had a lot of influences for parameter tuning. So to this end, we focused on two main research questions. The first being, how does CVR within a co-creative agent affect music producers' music output effects when evaluated on aesthetics? So rather than having necessarily a classifier, I don't have that. Um, I have what sounds good, which is already really vague. Um, so we were focusing on aesthetics rather than a pure classifier. And then how do music producers use adaptive plugins in a vocal audio chain? We are just exploring essentially how they're going to use something that they're already kind of familiar with, but if they were given a new plugin that had this new creative agent, how would they actually use that in their process? This is a brief video that goes over the experimental subject for our, or experimental setup for our pilot study. Um, this video was not shown to participants. I'm just going to show like the first 20 or 30 seconds of this because I think it gives a better description of what was actually happening uh, for this community. Most of you might not be aware of the digital audio workstation and what they're actually using to produce. Um, so I think this video will do a decent job explaining. Hey everybody. So my experiment will be conducted in Ableton Live Suite. And the reason for that is it has an adapter for Max for Live. Max for Live is how I created this experiment. I call it the CBR vocal chain, and I used Max MSP, which is just a visual programming language, to actually build this out. So the Max hash that I created has a start button, and then it has a compressor, a limiter and a saturator, an EQ, and a convolutional reverb. And then finally, the end button. There's this timer, and you'll have 180 seconds for each track that you're producing, and a trial count where you have 10 tracks total. So you'll produce 10, five male and five female vocal tracks in Ableton Live using this Max for Live patch that I created. Um, if you wondered why the quality was abysmal, it's because my laptop died finals week and all of my files were on the desktop. So a uh, note to future self to always back up twice and never leave anything on the desktop. Um, I will do the Max MSP live demo at the end, just that way I don't have to stop the slide presentation. Uh, but I'll give you a brief demo of what Max MSP actually looks like um, and how the graphical interface really affords us creating creative tools specifically in the domain that the artist is used to. What this community is probably most interested in is how we utilize the CBR cycle. So first, for the retrieval phase, we just based it solely on fundamental frequency, so it finds the 2k nearest neighbors. Um, and then interpolates between those two values, but again, for the retrieval, it just uses the fundamental frequency. This is the equation that we used for the reuse phase, so P is going to be the new parameter value. P1 and P2 are the uh, two nearest neighbor parameter values. F is the fundamental frequency of the current voice sample that they're producing. F1 and F2 are the fundamental frequencies of the two previous vocal samples. The last term there, this like a random function, uh, is a max and it just oscillates between one and zero uh, using like a pseudo randomizer in software. And then we're using only 10% of the maximum standard deviation of all of the vocal tracks that were used from noise. And the reason for this is even though we were interpolating between the two, we still wanted to add some randomness. So it didn't seem like we were just grabbing the two cases. Again, the voices aren't exactly the same. We'll see that in a later slide for the, the prosody elements. Um, so that's why we included this randomness kind of noise term. The revised phase, once the agent actually set all the selected parameters, the artist had the opportunity or the affordance to change and alter all 35 parameters within the plugin in order to achieve their musical goal, however they may see fit. Finally, for the retained phase, we just stored um, the case as an array of two sets, one with 35 parameter values, and then one for the vocal tracks. Um, and that was basically length, the fundamental frequency, and the standard deviation for the vocals. So for our usability study, uh, we really wanted to see two things, one being the experiment, and then two, the semi-structured interview that happened after the experiment. 
and it was when, uh, within subject, so all of the participants did everything. There were 10 music producers that we used to um, evaluate both the experiment and the semi-structured interview. Participants were again were instructed to produce tracks for two guide dichotomous genres. In the video, it said R&B and electric. We changed that a little bit. Uh, we went from R&B and we took away the genderized voices. So rather than saying male and female, um, we said soprano leaning or tenor leaning voices. And then we had five participants in one group, which was to alleviate ordering effects. So they did soprano leaning voices first and tenor and then five tenor and then soprano. That was 30 minutes for each session, but it really ended up being about an hour and a half. It ended up being almost an hour for every single interview, even though we assumed it was going to be around 30 minutes. Um, and then everyone was given $10 Amazon gift cards, so there was compensation at the end of the day for all of this. And the only other thing to really note here was that it was conducted in Ableton Live. The only reason why I bring this to attention is for creativity support tools. If you don't use something that the artist is um, used to or has the same affordances to operate in, it's essentially giving like an illustrator who works in Photoshop or Illustrator something like GIMP or Inks face and then asking them why they don't have the same autonomy within those software paradigms. If you are creating support, creative support tools, you shouldn't give them a user study that is outside of their domain of expertise. So for the demographic data for this, um, eight identified as male, which is pretty common, I would say, in music production. Um, most were in the United States, so N equals nine. And then all but one had at least one year of music production experience. The 212 that you see there is going to be two for a composition. So that participant was studying composition in New York for two years in their master's program, but they've been um, music programs and such for 12 years. So we had a full gamut of range of experience, and although not everybody had experience necessarily with Enableton Live, everybody did have experience with common DAW interaction patterns. And once you use one DAW, it's very, very similar to operate in another one. So we designed our CVR algorithm around few shot learning. So the algorithm learns over three trials and then tries to recommend parameters for the next two. So the trials were one through three, we got the cases from there and then, let me show this diagram actually really quick, it might be easier. If the trials were either uh, one to three or inclusive of six and eight, then we use the default parameters. Otherwise, we ended up using the recommended parameters from this. And we limited the input voices available to users of set of, of 10 samples that were all collected from a royalty-free website called Noise. So this table presents the vocal audio sample data from Noise. Um, what you can see here is the top five are the soprano leaning voices, and then the bottom five are going to be the tenor leaning voices. Uh, it's the length of the track, but they could modify that pretty easily. And then you have the fundamental frequency. The fundamental frequency is just the main of how they sound overall, and then the standard deviation of the voice clip. And everything was analyzed using Pratt, which is a linguistic um, software that a lot of people use in linguistic research for prosodic element analysis. Um, I'm going to play two tracks really quick. So this is the first sample ID one. Only way you're not and this is sample six. Whatever you want. So again, the aesthetic goal was either going to be acoustic for the first or electric, but it mainly was acoustic. Um, and then the third or the latter, the tenor leaning was R and B, and you can kind of hear that inflection in your voice. So we studied the range of adjustment for the 35 parameters in each trial right before the participant was satisfied with the results. And we recorded an average range of adjustment of 87.21 for the soprano leaning tracks, and then 69.7 for the tenor leaning tracks. That was all starting from the default values. For the interpolated values, we had an average of 76.24. The only reason why I didn't put both is they were basically the exact same. So what these results told us was that although they felt like they changed a lot more than they had, or there was a differentiation between starting from default or interpolated values, quantitatively, there really weren't. They clicked as just this many times, and then they changed each parameter or collectively changed parameters about on average of the same. 
So for the interview results, when the participants did act against the parameter, they were essentially surprised with what had happened and they thought it was either due to a bug in the system or something against that. So when, again, when they did act against the parameter selection, those would be the interpolated values. A lot of them did so because they thought something had messed up in the system or they broke the experiment. It was a lot of frustration in of themselves. Uh, which we found particularly interested just because the people who went along with the interpolated values were very happy for it. So it was essentially an act of surprise and some people fought against it and some people went for it. Here's a participant who did not super enjoy it. Um, so they said, um, and I think maybe the initial ones where I had to start trial were kind of the same, almost or not. They didn't really understand how it would jump around. Whenever they would hit start, it would either go back to the default values or the interpolated values. Some participants, again, noticed this and others did not. And a continuation of that, when asked how they would expect a tool to work, all of them had ideas on how a co-creative agent should assist them, and almost all of them were different. So they all had set expectations necessarily on how a co-creative agent in a music production process was supposed to act, and almost none of them aligned. So again, we showed that some participants were really keen on what had happened and others weren't necessarily as excited about that. Uh, we weren't sure about the exact results from the study, but we posited that a lot of it had to deal with the explainability of the co-creative agent. Uh, what I mean by that in terms of the explainability, there was almost no explanation that really happened. And all of them said, if there was some sort of explanation that gave me uh, an insight into the creative process, I might then be willing to work with the agent. Um, I would say for the majority of participants who had over 10 years of experience, that was not the case. They said they might, um, but they probably still would not use it. They would be more open to use it, but not necessarily willing to use it in their um, artistic adventures. And then lastly, we found that even though people were open to the idea of having a co-creative agent actually work alongside them, they were a little scared that it would hinder their creative potential. So this participant said, I feel like it can hinder the creativity to extent because I would be boxing myself in. So a lot of them thought that even though, again, it would be nice for them to learn over time, it might be boxing them into a particular genre. And if they want to segue that to a new album or something like that, we don't have cases for that. So how do we modulate from that and continue to learn their creative style over time? A potential limitation of this work was the number of cases. Obviously, we only had really three that we were holding, and then from there, we were recommending another two. So, few shot learning can be effective in many domains, but we might have been totally off base, and the research could have been affected severely by that. And then we don't really understand why the producers rejected a solution. Was it because of the interpretability of the solution, or was it actually because they just didn't understand the quality of the solution? Did they not like the interpolated values? Did they think it was against something that else they were doing? Um, so we're not entirely sure. But we posit again that explainable computational creativity, which is kind of a subfield of XAI in and of itself within the CC community, might be able to help us with this. Um, I can give the brief demo right now, and then I'll take questions if that's cool. Um, I'll just show Max MSP for about one minute, just so you have some context. Working on an extended display is a little bit difficult, so sorry. Um, I'm not sure if Max is going to work. We'll see on this for one second. <coughs> sure, so this is just a Max patch. Um, it's a graphical programming language, and basically, um, I'll just run it and then we'll show what it really does. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it.